Well, I'm going to shake up that a little bit this morning. As we know, over and over again, the disciples asked Jesus, when? When are you coming back? When are you going to? Because they had an idea. What was their idea? Their idea was the Messiah was always known for a um, physical governmental takeover. And so he would be a king of a physical realm. And so the Messiah is going to overthrow the Roman government, establish them as a world power, and they would be safe and blessed and prosperous and powerful and victorious, right? Well, it didn't happen quite that way. All those words apply, but not in the physical. And so we cannot look to the physical to see Jesus' victory. Interesting, right? It may, may sound, that may sound kind of off. Obviously, we see miracles. Obviously, we see bodies healed. We see people restored. We see families reconciled. Obviously, we see all that. And so God's kingdom does come and, and, and it, it influences, it, it crashes into our world. But Jesus is on the throne, King of all kings, Lord of all lords, already. We're not waiting for him to be that. But it's not necessarily in the physical realm. Right? It's in the heavens. Okay? So we want um, heaven on earth. We want that victory. We, We want that culture. We want those values on earth. Right? But it doesn't always happen it, with the laws, with the politicians, with uh, some of these things that we're looking for in the physical. We, we, can't, we can't look there. Like it definitely, that's a byproduct of heaven on earth. It changes things, right? But if we're lo- only looking there, we're going to miss it like the disciples did. When are you going to come and establish your kingdom on the earth? And he answered them so many times, he's like, that's not your focus. Right? That's not your focus. And so in uh, Matthew 24, obviously we read that last time, where they're saying, when, it, when are these things going to happen? When are you going to set up your kingdom on the earth? And he explains to them all this stuff that doesn't really answer what they're looking for. Right? And he's saying, just be careful. All these things are going to happen. There will be wars. People are going to hate you. There will be false, false prophets. And these false prophets, they'll say, I am the Messiah. All these false messiahs, right? And the reason is because in the Jewish culture, you know, people wanted to overthrow the government. And so they needed to get followers to get a big army and to do that. So they would say, listen, I am the Messiah, Follow me, let's overtake the government. It wasn't like just someone who was like mentally ill. No, it was the, they had a plan. They wanted power. They wanted people to follow them. So it wasn't something that was so totally off. Does that make sense? I mean, and, and also with the Holy Spirit coming upon people, people could have interpreted that in the wrong way. Oh my gosh, I feel the Holy Spirit. I feel the anointing on me. That must mean that God has anointed me to overthrow the Romans. This was where they were. This was their perspective. So I am the Messiah, right? Oh gosh, I hope no one takes that little clip from YouTube and put it somewhere. (laughs) That'd be funny. On TikTok over and over. I am the Messiah. (laughs) Pastor Joe said he's the Messiah. No, but they would say that it wasn't some loony tune. It was like, I have the Holy Spirit. Let's go, right? And so that's why he was saying, be careful, because many people will say, I am the Messiah. There'll be false prophets. But he's like, don't worry. When I come back, there is is a physical return of Jesus. We can't take that away. But when he comes back, he says, everyone's going to see it. Be like lightning from the end, this end to that end. Everyone will know. So don't be led astray saying, oh, the Messiah came over there and start running over there because everyone will know at the same time. Okay, so, okay, we got that. And we went through uh, 
1 through 14 in Matthew 24. And let me just read to you 15 through 28. It says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Whoever is on the housetop must not go down to get the things that are in their house. Whoever is in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. But pray that your flight will be not in the winter or on a Sabbath, for then there will be a great tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. That's not necessarily um, a technical, factual term. It's a, it's, a, it's a phrase or a saying from the Old Testament. It was a saying that's saying it's going to be really bad. Does that make sense? So if we take that word for word, we're going to say, oh, he's talking about the worst time ever in human history. But it was actually a saying. Does that make sense? Unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then if, if anyone says to you, behold, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe him. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders, so as to mislead, if, pos if possible, even the elect. Behold, I have told you in advance. So if they say to you, Behold, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. Or behold, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe them. For just as the lightning comes from the east, flashes even to the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. And so this has to do with a time that he's warning them. He's saying, look, I, I, I hope it doesn't happen. He doesn't even know exactly when. He's saying, I hope it doesn't happen in the winter. You get that? Like Jesus is saying, this is going to happen. I'm not sure exactly when. And so he's saying, hopefully you're not pregnant at those times. It'll be really hard if you're on the rooftop because they used to do a lot of things on their roof, dry laundry and different things. If you're on the roof and you see these things happen, don't even go back in. Like it's going to happen so quick. If, you, if you're in the field, because they were farmers at that time, don't go back home and collect your things. Just get out of there. Start running. And what is he talking about? The abomination of desolation, because it all hinges on that. If you see the abomination of desolation, okay, then you'll know, boom, you get out of there really quickly. Is he what, what, what era is he talking about? Well, this happened in A.D. 70. So the, he's talking about something that was in the future for them at that time, but we know afterwards it happened. So the abomination of, des of desolation is this. <clears throat> there will be an abomination, and that means that something will be set up in the temple, in the holy place, that should not be there, that will actually defile the temple. And so the, the, um, there was a revolt, and the Romans came and just wiped them out and actually slaughtered people in the temple. And you know that in the Old Testament, if someone, if there was a, um, a death or a murder or anything like that of a human being, the death of a human, it would defile anyone who was around that person, anyone who touches that person, or even the land, actually the land that was, it was on. And so we see in uh, Cain and Abel, we see that when um, Abel was killed, uh, God comes and he says, listen, I'm hearing the land crying out with his blood on the land. I'm hearing the land crying out. And so we know that the, that death and the blood of humans really affects things. And so the temple was a holy place. And so that defiled the temple. That was the abomination. And also they set up idol sacrifices in the temple, which would have defiled the holy place. And this has happened before, and this was spoken about before. So back in when Zechariah in the Old Testament was killed in the courts. And so this is, what the stuff that happens, sometimes we think, oh my gosh, this is, this is the end. Where he's talking about the end, you know, of all, of the, the, the zombie apocalypse, you know, and everyone thinks, well, to be ready means to get a four by four, go off the grid, you know, get my solar panels and, you know, just be, no, that's not what the biblical term is of being ready is. <laughs> so, but 
this has happened even before. So it's, some things are cyclical. They happen over and over, right? And so almost like the mark of the beast. Everyone thinks, oh my gosh, is this the mark of the beast? You can't buy or sell. Well, it's happened over and over. The spirit of that has happened over and over throughout history. So these things are cyclical. I'm not saying that, you know, there is a, a second coming of Jesus, of course. But you have to look at these things as what Jesus is talking about in the context. And he's saying this is going to happen. And we see it happen in AD 70. And what's crazy is that at that time, then um, they, because they destroyed the temple, all sacrifices ceased. So everything that the Jews did for guilt and for sin, they can no longer do. There are Jews today that are they're, they're missing a huge part of their sanctification. They have no place to sacrifice. They have no temple. So they're waiting for this time where they will rebuild the temple. But anyway, that's what abomination is. And then desolation was because the temple was totally leveled. <clears throat> so that abomination led to desolation. That's what this is talking about. And it happened in A.D. 70. And that's why he was very specific with them. This is, he's like talking to them like, this is going to happen to you. So if you're on the roof, don't go back down. If you're in the field, don't go back. This actually happened to them in A.D. 70. And this... They, see, they say that Matthew, the book, was written about A.D. 60. So this hadn't happened yet. <clears throat> and so we can't take these certain things and apply them to the end times when we know that this was a specific thing for them, to them, and it happened to them in A.D. 70. Does that make sense? <clears throat> so I just wanted to explain that little portion of it, and we'll get into verse 29 next week. But I wanted to go back to just their, um, their question. And we see it also in the book of Acts. Their question of when is this going to happen? Uh, tell us when the sign is. When are you going to return and set up your kingdom? And they asked it again in the book of Acts. So here it is in Matthew. They're asking before Jesus died. But when Jesus died and rose again, they're asking him the same question. So this is still on their minds. They're still looking for a physical kingdom. And in Acts 1, verse 4, it says, Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but wait for the, what the Father had promised, which he said, You heard of from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. In verse 6, he says, it says, So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? They're still looking for it. He said to them, this is pretty clear, it is not for you to know times or epochs, times or seasons, which the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you, so he's, he's saying, I want you to focus here. Because listen, the thing that you're concerned with, the thing that you're looking for, the thing that you're asking about, okay? Let's put that on the shelf because what you're supposed to be focused on is this over here. So he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. So there's a focus that Jesus wants on his people, right? And it's not necessarily that focus of when is he coming back. It is the focus of, you know, be ready because you don't know when he's coming back. So being ready all de depends on how you define the word church, the purpose of the church. And this is what's going to make you dangerous. How you define the word church. Okay? What does being ready look like? Well, we'll get into some parables at the end of Matthew 24 and even Matthew 25. <clears throat> and to, to be ready is not necessarily mean, you know, I'm reading my Bible, 
I'm having intimacy with Jesus. I'm going to church. Right? In the parables, he talks about to be ready, like with the master coming back, right? What does he find? To be ready is to be found doing the will of the Father. That's what being ready is. And so you may say, let's say if someone was going to medical school and they're studying, they're studying, they're, they're studying night and day, it's really tough. And they say, oh, what are you doing, whatever? And they say, I'm a doctor. And uh, you're like, no, you're going to medical school. That's, you're not a doctor yet. Right? No, 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 I'm a doctor. I'm studying. I know this stuff. I mean, I can quote to you all the things about anatomy and medicine, and I'm a doctor. Well, no, you're not a doctor because you're not practicing yet. You don't have a position. You don't have the degree. <clears throat> Oh no, but I'm studying. I know it all. I know it all up here. It's the same with someone saying, I'm a Christian. Because I study my Bible. Well, I, you know it all up here, but are you doing it? A Christian is not someone who studies. A Christian is someone who studies and then puts it into practice. A Christian who, is someone who studies and the Bible says, do the will of the Father, and you're actually doing it. Not just being able to quote it. So you're just like a, someone saying, I'm a doctor, I'm studying. No, you're not a doctor yet. Right? Because the Bible is very clear on what we should do. Just like it says right here. You will receive power for what? To be my witnesses. To be my witnesses. Do you know what that word witness is in the Greek? Martyr. Look it up. It's the word martyr. Wow. So don't focus on that. This is where I want you to focus on, Jesus is saying. This is where I want you to focus. I want you to be my martyrs in the world, my witnesses. I want you to go out and tell everybody. Okay. So being ready is when Jesus comes back, the Master comes back and finds us doing His will. Doing the assignment He's given us. Right? Let's look at the word church. The first time it happens, Jesus is talking to Peter. And He says, Peter, you're my rock. And on this rock, and the, His name Peter means rock, means like little rock. He says, on this rock, big rock, the foundation, I'm going to build my church. And the word church is ecclesia. What does ecclesia mean? Called out ones. Called out. Not called in. Called out. Out what? Out into the world. He says, listen, you are the light of the, what? The church? The world. You are the light of the world. What is it? I send you out as sheep amongst wolves. I send you out. The church is supposed to be a group of people who are sent out. It wasn't supposed to be to build these buildings all around the world and to all gather in. And it's all how you define the word church. We're, sent, we're called out ones. We're supposed to be out there being witnesses. That's the assignment. Don't ever let anyone tell you otherwise because I don't want you to go to heaven. This is, listen, this is the, the most loving thing I can do. I don't want you to go to heaven and Jesus saying, what did you do with what I gave you? And you're like, oh, we, I went to church. I read my Bible. I don't want you to regret what you did with your life. And this is going to make you dangerous. And this is the warfare around this message. That Satan wants you to be comfortable. He wants you to take care of yourself. He wants you to save yourself. When the Bible always said we're supposed to save others. But the church is saying save yourself. 
Go find some nice place where you can afford a home that's quiet and no one bothers you. And you can be a nice Christian there. Um, Let me tell you, you can't live out your assignment on a piece of property by yourself. It's impossible to be a witness. Redefining the church as the sent out ones. The church is people who bring heaven to the world. We are not to get saved and wait for Jesus to come back. That's not the goal of a Christian. We are not to gather and be safe. Safe isn't the goal of a Christian when the word witness is martyr. And we are not to focus on changing this physical world. We can get so distracted on making the, building the physical world. I can get so distracted on building a beautiful building. What's Jesus going to say to me if I go up there and I say, I, I built this beautiful building. So? <laughs> and? What would you do with it? Bringing heaven is to develop people's relationship with God and bringing His value system on the earth. So we are witnesses of Him. We bring heaven to people. It's as simple as this. Look, when you can find anyone who'd be willing for you to pray for them, that's all it takes. Why? Because God will show up and do the rest. You bring heaven in that situation. Right? Bring heaven in that situation. That's what we're called to do. Let me introduce you to the King of Kings. When they feel or experience God, they'll want to know more. But we have to take that time. It's always been Jesus, He demonstrated the kingdom, and He preached the kingdom. He validated the message by miracles. And so it has to be the same with us. If we are being created into the image of Jesus, it has to be the same. If it was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for us. We go and we pray for people. And we watch heaven descend on them. And then we explain to them what just happened. Well, when I pray, nothing happens. Keep praying. It's, we, we can't pray for someone to be healed and nothing happens and give up. When that's our assignment. Right? How, how many of you made, have never made an omelet and it didn't flip over correctly? Or maybe it was inside, it, was, it wasn't done. Do you stop making omelets? You keep going until you get it. God's going to move on your behalf. It may not be the first time or the hundredth time. But we are not supposed to just get saved, be safe, and wait for Jesus' return. Because what we're waiting on Jesus for, He's waiting on us for. We are waiting for Jesus to do something, right? Right? And He's waiting on us. He said, I've given you everything you need. Now go be dangerous. Don't allow fear to hold you back. Don't allow the fear of rejection to hold you back. Listen, there's a new generation. Us old people, we have to get on top of it because there's a new generation that are going to show us up. They're going to get the bug and they're going to start praying for people and seeing miracles and we're going to have to catch up. Because the power of God is ready and available. And the harvest is ripe. And the the Christian church has been comfortable and stagnant for way too long. We have lost our purpose and lost our assignment. I'm going to tell you what the 
church means. It means called out ones. And he's saying, don't worry about the times and the seasons. Listen, you are my witnesses. I'm going to give you power. You got everything you need. Now go. Go make disciples. If we lose that focus, we have lost our way. We, we, we talk, have you ever heard the, the word um, apostasy? People, and we think it's like people that are, have backslidden. Well, I'm telling you, if you're not being a witness, yeah, you're backslidden. Because that's our whole purpose. That's our whole purpose on the earth. The intimacy with God for me will always be number one. But that'll be number one for 10,000 years. We only, we're only on this earth for so long. For me, I have 80 more years left. So on this earth, our number one assignment is to be witnesses. And so we're, just, we're redefining what church means. And I hope we get a little uncomfortable. Because the kingdom has to go forth. When is Jesus coming back? I have no idea. But that's not our focus. Is he coming back? Oh yeah, he's coming back. But that's not my focus. My focus on, is on being witnesses. Being a witness for him. And Coast is a place where you'll get trained to do that. When this summer, God spoke to me so clearly. He said, I don't want you to be focused so much on, the church, on a, being a church anymore. I want you to be a training center. And so we're going to focus on training you and sending you out. Because you can do more than you think. God believes in you more than you believe in yourself. He's so confident in you. He's put so many gifts and talents in each one of you. And we're going to go for it. We're going to live like there's no tomorrow. Because there may not be. Come on. Let's stand. Let's pray. When are you coming back, Jesus? That's not for you guys to know. Let me tell you what you really need to focus on. Stay in Jerusalem and you will receive power. The power will come upon you and you'll be my witnesses. What does that mean? That means you'll be as witnesses just like Jesus was. You will see signs, wonders, and miracles. There are so many things right now in the world that are, un, you know, just not politically correct or whatever. So many laws going on. You have to, uh, you know, accept every, all these people and that person. You can't say anything to offend. Listen, there's no law against miracles. <clears throat> Come on. And so we're going to pray until we begin to see it. We're going to pray until we begin to see the miracles. And people are going to be attracted. They're not going to know what hit them. And they're going to be asking, what just happened to me? And we will be able to explain who Jesus is. All of you can explain who Jesus is. And you don't have to explain the entire theology class to them right there. You just say, come and see. Come and see. Why don't you come with me when I pray for the next person? In fact, why don't you pray for them? You'll begin to see who Jesus is. Jesus is not someone that we get to know from a book. Jesus is someone we get to know as we live it out and we live with him and we see him move. We see him move by our prayers we see Him move through our hands. We see Him move. We want to see Him move. 
I want you to see him move in your life. I want you to say, come back next week and say, God used me. God used me. Listen, there is a spirit of distraction. Remember how the Bible says, Jesus says it's really hard for the rich to enter the kingdom, right? It's not because they're bad people. It's because they get a boat and an extra house and they have their businesses explode and they don't have time. Let's have time for our assignment on the earth. Let's not get distracted. Let's not get distracted. Let's keep that at the forefront of our minds. Let's not then next week say, oh, what was last week's message about? No. Let's live out the message. I'm telling you, God's going to put it on your heart again. He's going to give us a second chance. He's going to put it on your heart of the people at the grocery store and your neighbors. He's going to say, go pray for them. And before we were like, oh no, I can't do that. But now we're going to say, yes, Lord. I want to be found doing your will when you come back. And I don't know if it's today, tonight, or tomorrow, but when you come back, you're going to find me doing your will. Jesus, give us boldness. Jesus, I don't care what the American church is doing in here, God. We want to be about your business. We want to shake off the grave clothes. We want to step into our destiny as Christians, little Christs, roaming the earth, wreaking havoc on the devil, pulling people from hell itself, seeing signs, wonders, and miracles. And we know, God, when it's time for us to open our mouths, you will fill it. You said, don't worry. Don't worry about what you're going to say. I will remind you when the time comes. So God, give us another chance, God. Give us another chance. Put people on our hearts. We will step out in boldness. We want to be ready at all times.